Have you ever wondered how music is chosen on BBC Radio? Well, if you have, you're going to want to watch this next episode with our guest, George Ergatudis, the former head of music at the BBC and now head of music at Apple in the UK and Ireland. We discuss the many factors that go into the BBC's choices of music, as well as the changing nature of the broadcast audience versus their online audience, and much, much more. Stay tuned. This episode of the Mubu TV Insider Video Series is brought to you by the Music Business Registry. The Music Business Registry is the leading music industry publisher of the most up-to-date contact information for major and independent record label A&R, music publishers, artist managers, music attorneys, music supervisors, and much, much more. The Music Business Registry is the trusted industry standard and source serving the music business community for over 30 years with the most accurate and up-to-date contact information available. Their titles include the a r Registry, the Film and Television Music Guide, the Music Publisher Registry, and the Music Attorney Registry. All of their publications are available in PDF, CSV, or online subscription. Visit musicregistry.com and use coupon code MUBUTV10 at checkout. That's musicregistry.com, coupon code MUBUTV10. When you're ready to put your music to work, musicregistry.com. Hi, we're live from Muse Expo here in Hollywood at the Roosevelt Hotel, and we managed to catch up with George Ergatudis, who is head of music for BBC Radio One and One Extra. George, thank you so much for doing this. I really it's appreciate pleasure. it. Pleasure. Um, what exactly does the job entail as being head of music for BBC One? So I'm responsible for music policy on both the stations. And what that means is obviously pretty much the music that we play at the end of the day, but especially during our daytime mainstream hours when we have millions of listeners because we operate a playlist. So there's 45 songs on that playlist on Radio 1, for instance, and a process of filtering has to happen. You know, there are thousands of new tracks potentially released every week or available every week. So how do you end up on 45 songs on that list? Right. It may be new seven, eight new editions every week. So I manage all of that process, the people involved with it. Are we playing the right range of music? We have to break, for instance, UK artists. So that's one of the prerequisites of the station. So we have to make sure that we're hitting that margin. There's a 40% minimum. And uh, the other things that I do, I handle kind of a senior level, the relationship that we have with the music industry. So whether it's CEOs, managers, uh, I deal a lot with those kind of people, top end people, both in terms of the direction of travel of Radio 1 and 1 Extra sort of they want to know what I'm thinking in terms of, you know, where do I hear things are going, et cetera. Um, I also lead the booking on our key events. So we do one massive festival style event every year called Ready One's Big Weekend. Mm -hmm. It's going to be in Glasgow in May in a few weeks time. And um, again, although I have a team that help, I take a lot of the steering of that within my realm. So we've got an incredible lineup. I, again, I can't tell you because it's not out there yet, but it's, it's a ridiculous lineup. So, you know, again, that's a big part of what I do. And then, yeah, you know, when we have access to some of the big names and we do get a lot of exclusive access and exclusive content, quite a lot of the time that might have come in by my, you know, by me. Okay. You know, you mentioned that the tracks... Uh, is a big part of the 45 records in your playlist. Yeah. I'd be curious if you can talk about it. What do you use as the criteria for whether or not you add a record? I, I, I mean, I'm asking because you also mentioned that you have the industry relations. There must be a lot of pressure from managers and so forth because of the value of what you do. So how do you make that determination? So broadly speaking, there's two stories to break okay. out here. Okay. So one of them is that from seven o'clock in the evening, we have specialist music shows uh, like Zane Lowe. Um, and those guys and women, they stand or fall on their brand values around the music they curate, the music they discover, the music they nurture. Okay. So we are trying to capture what they believe in and the kind of responses they gain from the audience that are really passionate about music that would choose to listen to something that is a little bit more specialist. So we have, for instance, a pre major playlist playlist meeting every week where the producers that are working on those shows, they sit down with my guys and they're talking about music. What's going on? What's happening? What's hot? And sometimes one week it's the dance and urban side of things. The next week it's the rock alternative and everything else kind of side of things. So we have that. We have that. We have experts in the building. There's a lot of passion in the building at Radio 1. I mean, this is a key thing, right? There's a lot of conversation about music going on. So that 
adds up to part of what I call our radar system. Then my music team, and I have one that works on one extra, one that works on Radio One. And we, again, everything we do is about either scheduling music or thinking about music, okay? So there are things that are more pop, more mainstream, that wouldn't necessarily get played in our evening shows. So we more directly are like taking a view on what's going on in those worlds. And again, for every act now, it's about looking up beyond the song. Now, the song is always going to be the most fundamental thing, followed by the brand of the artist. But on top of that, the other thing is, well, show me some metrics. What is going on? Okay. What, how many Twitter followers do you have? How many YouTube views have you got? And we all know that to a degree that stuff has become manipulable as much as those bodies, those companies are trying to fight the, the manipulation, it does go on. So sometimes we look at it and, you know, there's an element of trust or not. Um, but on top of all that, another tool that we think is really powerful now is Shazam. So, you know, Shazam doesn't cover everything, but particularly with rhythmic music is very powerful. So we could play a song on the radio once on radio one and see a great reaction on Shazam. So we're looking for that as well, but it doesn't help for everything. Sometimes it's going to be, my God, this song is so amazing. We don't care who it is. It's rare, but it happens every year. A few songs just so powerful. We just go for it. Can you remember the last one or the last yeah, well, that example? That yeah, was? I mean, just as one brand that always comes up, you know, uh, Carly Rae Jepsen, nobody knew the hell she was when we first called me baby, but it was just, oh my God, this song's incredible. Yeah. And you know what? The brand was neutral. Nobody knew who or what she was. You know, there was a Justin Bieber association, which wasn't necessarily a good thing in Radio One's world, but it didn't that. The video was good. The song was outstanding. You know, it didn't take too much thinking to go, we got to play that record. And, and it was a massive hit in England. Huge. Yeah, huge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely huge. When, when you're putting your playlist together, does, does what other radio stations play or are adding or getting a reaction to matter at all to you in the BBC One? Little, very little, to be honest. Um, I think there was a time maybe, you know, where we decade ago or ever when we'd look closely at what was going on in American radio, but it's a lot less now. We, I mean, you know, we, we do, I can't deny it because in terms of what I call, as I say, our radar system, we like looking at as many things as we can, but how much genuine influence does other radio have? Some, but not too much. Some, yes, because radio still internationally can drive hits. And so the knock-on effect of that might be that there is a story in Europe or there's a story in America, which probably was driven by radio, but maybe is reacting on iTunes or reacting on Shazam. And we do look at it. So as a byproduct, maybe of what radio are doing, mm -hmm. we are taking a view on it. One of the things you spoke of yesterday, or uh, yeah, I believe it was yesterday uh, on the panel, was the idea that the changing nature of radio. Uh, and what I'm curious about is, are people's relationship to radio changing? And if so, how does radio address that? Yeah. So from our point of view, the the issue, there's, there's a, and again, I'm going to break this down into yeah. two kind of areas, right? Broadly speaking, there's issue one, which is actually getting an audience, a new young audience to even think about radio, just putting that into their diet of content. So that's, that's problem number one. How do you do that? And there's a bunch of stuff about that in a minute, right? And then problem number two, which is, okay, we've got them, they understand radio. It's like, how do we keep them engaged with the content that we have? How do we keep them listening? Because, and I think I probably said this on the panel, smartphones, tablets, connected televisions, more laptops, more connected smart devices, essentially, right? Our young audience have access to that all the time, okay? So for them now, it's like they're facing a, a platform war, about which platforms actually get them the content they want to see or watch or hear. And then they have within those platforms just so much content. It's nuts. It's incredible. It's so competitive. So, you know, we're all operating in this ridiculously crowded market. And how do you make your brand stand out, jump to the top of the pile? So that when they're thinking about what do they value as a source, especially if it's music or entertainment, which is what Radio One is in, right? Mm -hmm. So the broader story for us is how do we make Radio One as a brand or One Extra as a brand relevant in that space? And for us, that means on our on smartphones, what's our play? And 
why we've invested a lot of time and effort on YouTube, for instance, Ready One's YouTube channel, because we've grown that in the last year from somewhere in the region of around 200,000 subscribers to around 1.17 million subscribers. And we were the first radio station in the world to hit a million subscribers. So we got a Guinness World Record in January, which was very nice. And YouTube gave us this gold, big gold button thing. <laughs> and that, those numbers are still building really fast. So again, kids and I see I've got an 18 year old and a 15 year old and the amount of consumption of entertainment that's coming via YouTube now is nuts it really is so whether they're pulling it up on television on the iMac in the corner of the room or on their phones it's like huge so being in that space is really important and obviously ultimately for us it's trying to push back to the radio brand if we can but just having Radio 1 as an entity as a brand awareness factor to just get them to figure, look, oh my God, this brand is giving me really good content. Maybe I should go and listen to what they're doing live on the radio. Then we're going to be doing okay. Now it's a battle. There's no doubt. At the moment, the total number, the percentage of every 15 to 24 in the UK is strong. It's 42% of all 15 to 24 year olds listen okay. to us for a minimum 15, 15 minutes. And the average amount of time they're spending is about six hours, 40 minutes. So it's still good. I mean, you know, we've got a war on. That's the way we look at look at it. But we're doing okay. It's interesting. You know, it, it's been said that the greatest, most valuable component in music today, uh, especially in the marketing of music, mm. uh, is not uh, money. It's not power. Mm. It's not market share. It's people's attention. Yeah. And you've just addressed a very, very important part of that at the BBC. You have a very important component, which is online. Yeah. And I'm curious, can you talk about some of the initiatives that BBC uses online to reach that particular audience? That's part one. And part two is, do you find that that's a different audience than your terrestrial radio listener? Okay. So broadly speaking, um, obviously the BBC developed websites, as did every content company that figured this is where the world's going, you know, a long time ago, back in the 90s, the embryonic stages. And over time, that technology plays become more complex as the world's changed and technology's developed and devices have changed. So, and now a very, very key component of the BBC's um, online platform play is iPlayer. So the BBC developed this as an app. There's a version for tablets coming very soon. Actually, it should be all there, but it isn't there yet. There's one now. We've broken it in two as well. There was initially an app that radio and television, all the content was in one place. We've now broken it in two. So there is now an iPlayer television portal, and you can see live TV channels from the BBC or on-demand content. And now there is an equivalent iPlayer radio app, which is, again, on-demand or live radio. And it's available on smartphones, really simple to use. And again, simplicity is really important, again, for the audience to be able to get to the content they want really fast. There's a journey going on from the BBC, which is about personalization, okay? So it's to get people, understand people a little bit more and start being able to connect them to the content they're more likely to enjoy from the BBC. So that is improving, searchability is improving. So, you know, a lot of what we do, I would say, broadly speaking, is always in this, like, experimental phase almost you have to put it out there and then iterate it and it's not very different from what apple might do or google might do to be honest and you know even in, even our social networking policies you know they're always in flux in terms of well what's the best way to handle that and figuring out what really works what you know isn't just a play to build numbers and metrics but actually connects the audience with the content you're doing so you know we changed our policy on that probably three times and you know the, the latest version is that we have dedicated a dedicated producer on one extra and another dedicated producer on radio one that are being the authentic voice of the station in the official channels so all the djs you know they have facebook and twitter and everything and we don't manage that or interfere with that but it's not officially from the BBC. That's building their own brands. And I sometimes use this supermarket analogy of Radio One's this big mothership brand, the supermarket. And then we want to stop fantastic, powerful, cut through brands in the supermarket. So whether it is Zane Lowe or the breakfast show DJ Nick Grimshaw, you know, they're big brands. They're building their own brands. We want to help them build their own brands in the way that a supermarket wants to keep Coke being relevant and they'll work with them on that. It's exactly that analogy, you know. So, um, yeah, hopefully there's something in that. Okay. You know, in listening to you, one of the things that I, I find so interesting is the breadth 
of mm. how extensive, you know, the music culture uh, that you seem to want to reach within the BBC. And my question to you is sort of a, a broader one. From your experience, do you think, based on your travels, that the music culture in England is different from the music culture, perhaps, let's say, in the United States? And if so, how? Yeah. I mean, one of the most direct and obvious things is that, and it's always surprised me in a way, I mean, I kind of understand how it's arrived at this, but the US radio is so ghettoized. It's, it's incredible. I also think that's very out of kilter, actually, with the way young audiences relate and think about music now. Fortunately for Radio 1, we've never been in that boat. We've never been ghettoizing it. I mean, one extra is about as near as it gets, you know. Um, but Radio 1, you're going to hear the hottest music relevant to a young audience, whether it's rock, alternative, trap, or dubstep in terms of new genres that have emerged. EDM, dance music, pop music, it's all there. And when we go out and talk to the audience that like what we do, and it, as I say, it's broadly nearly 50%, half the country's young people, they love the fact that we are continuously surprising them. That they don't want to hear just rock all day. They don't want to hear just pop all day. They don't want to hear just dance all day. If they want to, and we all know this, they can go off to discrete channels, whether it's on a streaming play or whatever, and hear that or dedicate stations that do that. And of course, some of the some of the audience want that. But actually, there's a huge and significant part of the young British audience that want the variety that we bring. They want to hear new things. They want to hear where things are going. They know it's not a one-track world. And that variety just really excites them and interests them. So of course, and I haven't even mentioned this, you know, we're very much about getting the music right. Really, we are. And we genuinely think we make a difference because of the variety that we do, the variety that we bring. And the fact that we very carefully balance what is the more popular end of the current music scene with new and emerging sounds, new and emerging songs. And you push it too far, you lose the millions. But, you know, we've got nearly 12 million listeners every week. And by introducing that number of people to new acts they've never heard before, we really make a difference. So it's a, it's a, it's a play that works for us. And I think it's very different from American radio in particular. In fact, I think as far as I can figure, there's nowhere in the world that would probably go for the breadth of genres that we do. There are places that have a more breadth in American radio, but not as much as we would do. No, exactly. I, I, I completely agree with you. Can you talk, or are there initiatives that you're putting into place at the BBC that you can share with us? New ones. Well, there are always things going on. And, and, and so I can tell you about one or two that are out okay. there, okay, that are quite new. There are things that I can't. Um, so BBC Playlister, for instance, is a fairly new initiative. What that essentially does, and again, I'm going to break this down. with breaking things down into two things, right? But there is, there's two aspects to this technology. One is that if you are listening to BBC content or even watching it potentially on a smart connected device, you can touch your screen against a song that you like and essentially build a playlist, okay? The things that you've heard that really, wow, that was hot. You can then inject that list into Spotify at the moment or YouTube and there'll be future partners where the beats arrive or whatever, you know, there's going to be others. The other side of this is that because a powerful part of what the BBC and the value the BBC brings in music is about curation, right? It's about we're trusted to, to dig up hot stuff or just as a, for instance, you know, we did, I think the hundred greatest hip hop tracks. What we can do is curate a list have it there, and then you don't need to build your own. You can just go, right, what's Fern Cotton listening to? What's Zane Lowe listening to? And then inject that stuff, their list of current stuff, into a playlist again and build yourself a playlist. So that's, you know, version one of this. I think there's places to go with that that we're working on. But at the moment, it's out there and it's 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 building. You know, we're gradually marketing it and, it, and it's getting ahead of steam. So that's one big technology play. And, uh, you know, then there are other deals in terms of Radio 1 has so much powerful, exclusive content. What do we do with that? And so we're talking with some new partners about how we do that. And there's a commercial side to that. So we have a public service window of 30 days, but after 30 days, it's commercially exploitable. And, we, you know, we're looking at deals there as well. So Live Lounge, which is a very, very cut through piece of content for us. Uh, I mean, again, people have copied this, but we're ahead of the game on it. Artists come in, they do their current song, they do a cover version, unique cover version, but we get millions of hits on YouTube. I mean, some of them are up to 18 million views uh, on some of those songs. And we have a very successful compilation album series off the back of that. Very successful. So now it's about actually we're talking to other partners about how we take that even further. Some really fascinating views on radio from one of the leading broadcasters in the medium, 
BBC Radio. So, insiders, question of the day. What were the most educational aspects of George's discussion with us? Was it his criteria that he used for adding music to his programs? Or was it the BBC's initiatives in reaching their audience online? Or was it his views on the music culture in the UK versus the US? Or perhaps it was something else that connected with you. Do you have any ideas or experiences that you'd like to share regarding this video? We'd love to hear from you and connect in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching this video. Make sure to subscribe to Mubu TV for more information on how to educate, empower, and engage your music career. You can also check out a summary of this episode and everything we talked about in the YouTube description as well. And if you enjoyed this video, we'd really love it if you hit the like button and let us know what other kinds of videos and types of content you want to see on our channel. Hit us up in the comments below, and we'll see you in the next video.